Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation with uh, the theater makers of NACO's production of Out of Time uh, in partnership with the Public Theater. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, my name is Peter Kim. I'm the creative producer of NACO, and I'm joined by uh, this wonderful array of panelists. And uh, I'm going to throw it over to Kaysen. Hello, my name is Kaysen Marroquin, and I'm the uh, production stage manager for Out of Time, and my pronouns are they and he. And I will throw it to Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Lenny. I'm the dramaturg for the production. Hi, Sarah. Uh, we're going to throw it now to Natsuko. Uh, I'm Natsuko Hama. I'm one of the actors in the Disturbance Specialist, and I play Leonie Z. Great. So I just want to start with a little context to Out of Time uh, for our listeners who may not know. Uh, Out of Time is a collection of five world premiere monologues written by five Asian American women playwrights that were commissioned in the summer of 2020, um, uh, commissioned by NACO that is. And the playwrights were tasked with writing a monologue specifically for an actor over 60, uh, along with the prompt to just write about the moment. And we were fortunate to have a workshop of Out of Time in November at the public studios, uh, the public's new rehearsal spaces. And we were joined uh, by, we were joined, uh, Sarah Natsuko and Kaysen, our stage manager was able to join us. So uh, Sarah, I'll throw it to you. Were there any discoveries, uh, considerations that you learned from the workshop and uh, through the rehearsal process, taking into account artists over 60, uh, including our director, Les Waters, who is also over 60. Sure, yeah. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, um, and it, it's, um, I'm, I'm grateful that Nats is here and can speak to this from the perspective of a performer in the piece, um, but a conversation that we started having in earnest during the workshop um, had to do with memorization. Um, and I think that it's a special consideration for this project, not only because the performers are over 60, but also because of the, the form that we're working in. All of these pieces are long form monologues, at least 30 minutes. Um, and so th that also just has to do with <laughs> Um, the sort of endurance required and the density of the text and the fact that um, there's no scene partner to, to cue the actors internally, um, all of which I'm sort of speaking out, uh, speaking about not as a performer. <laughs> um, but uh, it was something that, that Natsuko brought up during the workshop that some other actors brought up during the workshop, just as a question, um, you know, had, had we thought about it? And I think particularly because it's a new play process and um, generally it is customary in a new play process to let everything stay rather open very late. Um, so, um, which is sort of part of my um, scope as the dramaturg working with new writers, you know, to be very involved in that conversation about exploration of text, discovery in the room, in that live collaboration, um, and can often include really robust revision all the way through the rehearsal process and into previews um, when you're learning so much from an audience. Um, so I've, I've worked on a lot of plays where the, the script, I'm sure that that Nats has as well, um, where the, the script has continued to change quite dramatically up through opening um, or shortly before opening. And for a variety of reasons, um, we realized during the workshop that that probably wouldn't serve us here. Um, and so we had a conversation among the creative and producing team and then 
then with each of the writers about how we could design a process um, that would allow the writer's room to sort of explore and learn from their actors and learn as the piece was sort of breathing and growing in rehearsal, um, but also respect the actor's process and give them time to really, um, to really learn the piece in an embodied way and have full command of it um, in order to support the kind of exploration that will really make it sing in performance. Um, so I think that this, this would have been an important conversation um, working with any actors on long form monologues, but particularly um, working with a group of actors over 60, I, th I think that there's um, respect that needs to be given to just like time, time, time to learn. Um, so yeah, that, that's something that comes to mind in terms of discoveries during workshops for sure. Well, that's great. Cause uh, I'm gonna pivot now to Natsuko. And if you wouldn't mind talking about um, that uh, discovery that you made during the workshop of, you know, vo uh, vo voicing your needs or concerns or about, you know, the length of the piece, memorization and such. And if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about that, that'd be great. Sure. Um, what I learned in the workshop, you, you know, the my piece is a very long piece. And I think, you know, I made the, once I saw the length of it, it's lucky in the sense that I have a history of doing very, very long language plays. A lot of Shakespeare and a lot of Beckett. Uh, the thing is, is that in modern plays, you don't have those little hooks like rhythm and, and uh, you know, one can learn a, a certain iambic pentameter thing fairly quickly, relatively quickly, and it it stays with you. The, when you're write, when you're reading new material that you have no relationship to, and then have to understand the motivations, uh, that becomes hard. So I knew going into the workshop that my main thing, uh, and and probably a lot of older actors, it isn't really about age so much because everyone has their different uh, experiences. I, I don't think you can do Hamlet later if you haven't done it earlier, for example. You have to have had those muscles working. And and in our group of people, luckily, you know, we have actors who are very, very experienced. So you, you get more efficient in a certain way. But the line learning was the most important number one priority so I, I didn't have any qualms about asking for that because in the end it's going to be what people see and then it's only going to come through this vessel and this vessel has to be there <laughs> because it doesn't you know ultimately in the real world it, I have to be able to carry forth uh, Sam's language for example uh, so I learned that uh, it's Did harder. You, sorry, uh, go ahead. It's harder to retrofit a bridge than it is to build a bridge from the beginning. It costs more. The bolts are a little bit creaky. You have to, re it's a different thing, you know? So I decided I'm going to learn this thing. I don't care how many versions go through it. And you take a gamble with it. You go, okay, they're going to change it. I don't care. I'm going to have to do the best I can with what I have. And then I know it's hard to rework that, but one has to gamble in that way. And it was very helpful, even though a lot of people would find that frustrating to have to relearn and change. And Sarah's right, a single word is harder to insert into that text than a whole new sentence. That's good. Do you feel that what you're talking about with, with learning the material is a thing about working on new work as opposed to an age thing? Or like, for instance, if you were to work on this piece 20 years ago, would you still have the same, I don't know, I don't wanna say apprehensions, but or concerns that you would today? Um, I would probably have apprehensions, but 
have much more of an appetite for it. You know, it'd be more exciting to to uh, say all those words. I don't really care about saying all those words so much anymore. You know, we kind of just want to go on stage and stand there and be silent. It, it's a, <laughs> so that's kind of different in, in the change. I'm just used to doing it. That's all. And I don't, it's a, uh, you know, the uh, gift from Sam is a remarkable writer. That's what I will say. She's a remarkable writer. Absolutely. And her words, and I've watched the evolution of these different versions, they get uh, more incisive, more uh, clear. Um, they're uh, laying down the rails of how I'm to think. She gives me lots of clues. Uh, she has a really tremendous understanding. She can also cut her own language, which is almost impossible for many writers. It's really, and in an intelligent, sensitive, uh, creative way. Uh, Sarah's responsible for that too. Thank you. Uh, so the, the piece, the piece itself is quite tremendous. And that, that's a difference whether it's 20 years ago or, or now, if the piece isn't uh, great, intelligent in its journey, then it's not as easy to learn. And it speaking is. Of Sam, speaking mm. of Sam, speaking um, of Sam, you know, these pieces, as I mentioned earlier, were commissioned, um, keeping in mind uh, having an actor over 60 performing it. Uh, as you've worked on the piece, Natsuko, do you, can you talk a little bit of what it feels like to have a piece written with that age requirement in mind? Uh, and also what it feels like having a piece kind of written on you, if you will? Uh, yeah. Uh, at first it was very daunting because I couldn't retain anything. That was really humiliating. I, this is all private work that's going on with maybe a select few group of friends that are helping me. Uh, it was a very, very slow, and then I could not retain it. So that was sort of scary. Uh, as I did it more and more and more, it became better. I became more precise. And I'm sort of in the halfway point now even though I can do it very slowly, uh, dead letter perfect, I can't do it fast. And you have to do it fast in order to think, to, to match the thoughts. Um, so uh, what was the second part of your your question, Peter? Sorry. No, so it's okay. What, yeah. what it felt like, if anything, to have a piece written kind of on you. Oh, well, that was, that was, uh, Fantastic. Like, I love going to rehearsal. I love to see what she was going to uh, do and the changes. I mean, in, in a way, you know, we're all in these isolated Zoom boxes of, of rehearsal. I don't get to see Mia. You know, I don't get to see anybody else. I didn't know what Glenn, nothing. And so we're just focusing on this play. To me, this play is my whole world, literally. I cannot. Uh, fool around. I can't go to other shows. I can't listen to, you know, regular television, anything. It's only this language. And so just getting to be inside of what Sam is thinking. And then I, I don't know if I affected her. I don't think particularly. I mean, we would assume that I did, but it doesn't. I think it's safe to assume that that you did. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. It feels like I am waiting to see what music is going to be played through me. And that is very exciting to me. But I can't go, I can't really see the other direction. I, I can't, I don't really, you know, I'm just looking at what she's giving me and then how does that go through me? I don't know how that goes the other way. I mean, I honestly can't imagine what that is like. I can't feel that. Thanks for sharing that, that's a go. It, you know, I, I just have to say for me, one of the extraordinary pleasures for all of these projects, but I'm thinking specifically about Disturbance Specialist, the piece that you're working on. Um, 
that feels very present in this process because they're monologues is the um, the author performer relationship and the directness of that. Mm. Um, and that's, I have to say the first time that we heard you read this, um, it was exhilarating, do you know? I mean, really astonishing. And I don't know if that was a cold read the first time that we heard heard you or I mean, how much time you had spent with it. But as you have alluded to it, it's, it's, a, it's a very long piece with some very surprising turns along the way. Um, it's demanding a lot of a performer. And I know that, that Les and Sam and I felt um, just thrilled to find that we had a partner who could match that material and um, inform it and breathe life into it. And all of the changes that Sam has been making in these last weeks have been in deep conversation with you and watching you live inside it and learning about learning about the writing through mm -hmm. you. Um, and I think that that's always the case um, in a rehearsal process, but it has felt especially powerful to me because that partnership is so direct. Um, like really more than any other artistic partnership in this process, I would say that I feel very aware of um, the writer performer dance in these pieces, which has really been a pleasure. That's hilarious. I don't experience it like that. I just feel like, oh, I'm listening to her. That, that's what that's I- so interesting. Yeah, it's like- I find that fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah. Sarah, will you be so kind? Hi, <laughs> will you be so kind as to tell our listeners what it is a dramaturg does? Um, yeah, it's so funny. I mean, I've been doing I've been doing this strange job for a while, and I'm still not good at answering this question. Is the truth? It's a good question. It's an unfamiliar word to a lot of people. Um, but uh, I still have trouble just yeah. even saying the word, Sarah. It's a weird. It's a weird word. It sounds like you're sneezing or something. Um, no, I got uh, really clearing your throat. We should cut this. This is terrible. Um, <laughs> um, no, I mean, it, it, the, the sort of like maddeningly ambiguous non-committal dramaturg answer is that it depends. It's like very contextual. Um, the work that I do, which is mostly in the space of new plays and new play development, um, I'm, I'm working as a collaborative editor, I think would be one way to sort of try to get at it. Um, the relationship is often most direct with the writer. It's often the writer who invites me into collaboration. Um, in the case of these projects, I, it was actually Les, the director, um, who asked me to join the collaboration. And he and I have worked together um, for a long time now on a lot of different projects. And he would have to tell you why he wanted to work with a dramaturg here. Um, but I think, um, my hope is to make myself useful <laughs> to the sort of unfolding of the thing. And um, that includes a lot of relationship building at the beginning and trying to learn about everyone's process and figuring out what they need. Um, so it, it, for me in this project, there are five writers and my relationship to each of those pieces and to each of those writers is really different. Um, with the piece that we've been talking about with Natsuko, um, Sam Chance's disturbance specialist, a lot of that work has been about the sort of sculpting of the text and looking for opportunities for, for cutting um, that doesn't feel arbitrary or for the sake of length, but that actually feels about really sharpening the thought journey through the piece um, and mapping how it builds and accumulates for the, for the character. Um, so I've been working with Sam on that um, in the room, but like a lot of that outside of the room actually in conversation with Sam. Um, and then I, I think a lot of what I'm doing in the room um, is just being an early audience member, actually, just like that I am I am a person who <laughs> who the words can be landing on um, and that I can be responding. And 
the work is created with the intention of sharing it. And so I think there's sort of a circuit complete that happens when someone can receive it. Um, uh, so that sounds a little woo woo, but I think that part of my job is to be somebody experiencing the work as it is being made and then responding to um, what I'm experiencing, hopefully in a way that feels additive to process and sort of allows the different generative artists um, to continue to make thoughtful decisions about how they're calibrating. Um, and like, but the truth is in terms of like how you're asking that question, like, what does that mean? Like, I'm sure that that's all maddeningly vague. Um, like Actually, I, I don't. I, I think that was incredibly succinct. Um, and I will just add that as a as the creative producer, um, I really felt it was, I'm so grateful actually to the work that you've brought Sarah to the process, especially because I, I find that a dramaturg is so necessary for this piece in particular, because we're working on five essentially new plays. And we have a very truncated process, like you were mentioning earlier, the new play development process can be years, actually, you know, with numerous workshops and readings. And um, this production came together quite quickly, uh, which is really special and exciting, but also a little bit panic inducing. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I 100% understand why Les wanted you and why uh, NACO felt it was really important to bring you on as well for the betterment of the pieces, um, especially in the, the circumstances that, you know, we were in. Can, so. I, can, I, can I say something too? I, I think because the theater is such a collaborative process is that, uh, and writing can be so lonely and so singular that to have a knowledgeable, intelligent, experienced person to uh, shoot that back and forth with that doesn't have the responsibility of direction, but brings the insight and the uh, uh, emotional understanding of something is, in new pieces in particular, it's very important. It's very important. I think some of our audiences might be wondering, well, can't a director just figure that out with a writer? Like, why do you need another person? And I think that sometimes works depending on the relationship of the writer and the director, but uh, it is really incredibly helpful to have another person that has uh, that perspective in the room, like you were saying, Natsuko, that doesn't have the responsibility of a director. Because I think a lot of times directors um, they're trying to problem solve, actually. They're trying to fix what the, the writer has, sorry, I didn't say fix. They're trying to just stage, if you will, or make sense of the, of the piece that is in front of them that they've been given, as opposed to a dramaturg is really asking these questions of the piece itself and trying to make the piece, in fact, more fully what it wants to be. Not that a director can't do that, but sometimes they are slightly competing. Um, they are competing, uh, what's the word, um, desires for a director. I, you know, it's it's so interesting. I mean, I, re I really think that the best directors are dramaturgs, whether they want to use that language, like whether that's how they think about it. In my experience, um, the best directors are bringing a dramaturgical sensibility um, to the way that they approach a piece. And I also agree that it doesn't matter how, how brilliant you are or how much of that sensitivity and intelligence you bring as part of your work as a director, you can't sit inside both roles at the same time. And I think it has to do with attention and just sort of like the, I mean, People, people don't understand what a dramaturg does. People also don't understand what a director does, actually. Um, um, and the the amount of decision making and um, that a director is responsible for inside a given moment, and the ways in which their attention is is being split, and the number of different people who are asking them to offer their attention and um, sort of sensitively synthesize it's it's astonishing like the work of a director is astonishing and i think that um 
it just has to be someone else. <laughs> like, I think even the benefit of like literally any other person, not even necessarily a particularly sensitive or intelligent other person, but just someone else sitting next to you um, who doesn't have the weight of that decision-making um, and like all of that incoming expectation who can just be experiencing it and, and be a conversation partner. I, I, I think it's just like two is better than one. So. Well, I'll only push back on that theory, Sarah, that like, I wouldn't want, you know, my sister who has no idea about theater sitting in, in the room <laughs> with process. I don't know if she, she, she's very smart, but I don't know if she would bring, you know, much to the table in terms of new play development. But um, actually speaking of other people in the room, I, I think uh, it, this is a great opportunity to talk to Kaysen. Uh, the production stage manager and Kaysen, you know, something that I really appreciate about working with you is that um, how much of a collaborator you are in the process. And um, I would love for you to just talk about um, your experience thus far working on the workshop as well as on uh, in rehearsals now of the considerations and discoveries uh, you've you've made uh, in relationship to working on these pieces that were specifically for actors over 60, as well as our director who is also over 60. Thank you, Peter. Um, and thank you for that compliment. As the production stage manager, as a stage manager, I think that all stage managers have their own unique style and way they like to work and do things. And kind of going off of what y'all were just talking about of being another person in the room, um, I also like that to be part of what I do as a stage manager. However, like Sarah was saying, um, I can't have that full focus either. So that's another reason why it's great to have dramaturg in the room and Sarah in the room, um, because I'm simultaneously doing work for the production as I'm watching. Um, however, I do really value my relationship with the director and with Les um, specifically. And I'm happy to be a collaborator in that way um, on all levels in big picture and small details. In regards to discoveries on this process, part of my style as a stage manager is that I like to look at the production and the people involved holistically. And we are all humans first. So my priority for the production is to take care of the people involved and the work involved. Um, but you don't get the work if the people aren't taken care of. So I want to make sure, even if it's not me, if I'm having to focus on something more technical, I want to make sure someone is in the room doing that. And I think this process has been great because there have been multiple people kind of looking towards that um, priority and taking care of it as well, um, including you, Peter, and you, Sarah. And um, yes, so for me, when I go into a process, it doesn't, um, I look at the community of whoever is involved, no matter what those demographics are. And I take into account everybody's individual ways of working and preferences as much as I possibly can um, within my limitations as a stage manager. And for this production, it was a lot of discoveries about the individuals. And it was actually, it is great that it is a, kind of a smaller company because that means that we can really take into account preferences in regards to how everybody works. Um, because these are monologues, there are a million lines to learn for everyone. And I am blown away by everyone involved in their memorization. I know I couldn't do that. So I admire it and I want to support that however I can, um, as does Narissa, the assistant stage manager, and John in our PA. Um, we talked early in the process during the workshop actually about how to support line running and line learning and decided to bring on an additional person, uh, which is John in to primarily work with the actors on line running. Um, and Narissa, the assistant stage manager is taking line notes in the room and on book and we're making sure we're being supportive in that way. Uh, a few other ways we talked about preferences is talking about schedule and seeing how each how long each actor likes to work and when it becomes not productive rather than prescribing that for them 
So we try to ask as much as we can if a certain amount of time is good for them or if they need longer or shorter, or actually if they would rather not work with someone running lines as one of our actors prefers to learn on her own. Um, so we take that into account. And we actually have a separate line running room going at the same time as our rehearsal room. So that way we're working with one actor in the room and another is working on running lines and we can use our time productively that way. Um, in regards to working with the humans in the room and taking care of their well-being, um, especially after this time of COVID, we've learned a lot and everyone is still dealing with that. So everybody's capacities are at different levels. And uh, we've had some shorter rehearsal days that we still take lunch breaks during. You know, it could be a five hour day or a six hour day and we're still choosing to take an hour long lunch because that is helping everyone in the company to be their best selves for the work. Um, we're also taking into account, you know, everybody has good and bad days where they're at different levels. So being flexible and patient with that with everyone. And um, we do have a weekly schedule. It comes out at the beginning of the week. And um, if I could, I would bring it, put it out earlier. However, everybody knows that there's so many moving pieces in the theater that that's hard to do. Um, but I've not worked on many processes where there's a weekly schedule given at the beginning of the week. And um, I think that is also something unique that we're doing. And all of these things and practices kind of came up as discoveries. We, uh, as a group, hypothesized about how we could best support the company. And some of these things came up and we've been adjusting as we've been going. Um, what else? Uh, we're not something doing... that... yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to add, you know, something that we collectively spoke about, um, I think after the workshop and before going into rehearsal was taking into Les's own capacity, right. um, not only the actors, but like our director, how, you know, he's never directed five monologues um, before. And so really figuring out too with him, how, how much time is too much time actually, you know, wh where is your breaking point? And then also, you know, we are doing a five day work week um, as opposed to a six day work week, which was also a very intentional uh, choice. Uh, if you, I don't know if that's. Definitely. Yeah, um, that was very intentional and we're not doing 10 out of 12s. And uh, I said earlier, no matter the demographic, I take into account the individuals involved. Um, however, I do recognize that it's important to recognize the demographic that we're working with as well, um, because Les identifies as old, and that is important to him. And um, so we take that into account as well. And uh, that's something that we've been working with. And, you know, not everybody does, but there are certain, you know, um, things to consider in regards to the well-being of the company that may not be taken into consideration in another production or process rather. I, I just uh, want to point out that, uh, you know, I, I'm working on these lines, right? So I can kind of remember the lines, but I often can't remember my uh, public theater identification. I have called <laughs> Just as I'm entering, and then I call Kason and I say, Kason, I had it right by the door. I, I, I forgot to put it on. He said, that's okay. You know, it's, it, so that's a little thing. That's a little thing, dealing with us. I mean, I don't want to infantilize us, but the, no. the thing is helpful. <laughs> I'm glad that's helpful. Also say, um, it, it's, it's interesting to think about sort of intersectionality in all of this because you know the the context of this conversation is age um but i would say um like as a new mom i have a toddler i, I became a parent during the pandemic and right now i'm seven months pregnant and the five day work week means a lot to me um and the hour long lunch break means a lot to me um so i think that case in what you're talking about um thinking about taking care of the people and um asking individuals what their needs are is like I, I feel that in this production and in the way that you are leading this room um, and it makes a big difference and I think it does support the work. I 100% agree. Uh, 
you know, in the few minutes that we have remaining, I just think that, you know, I think age and all, and it's just part of a larger conversation around inclusivity and around what, what the American theater is reckoning with right now, post COVID, post racial reckoning, post all of these things that we're encountering. Um, and I guess is if there is anything else, you know, uh, any anything that you feel like you you wish or um, that could be part of the process now. I mean, obviously the five day work week is is really helpful. The shorter, you know, not doing ten out of twelves anymore. Um, you know, just curious if there's anything else that would be like, oh, that'd be amazing if that that could happen in in the process. Um, that's a good question. I think, I don't know if I can think of anything specifically in that regard. I did think that even through all of these, I can kind of feel, at least for myself internally, I can only speak for myself, but the sense of urgency that existed in the before times um, internally kind of comes back for me sometimes. And I'm like, no, it's okay. We don't have, this doesn't have to be done right now. Um, we can take this extra time to do this. Uh, those things and I think it might be coming up for a lot of people so I think everyone's kind of fighting that and trying to figure out the balance of how to work and how to move forward with this new understanding that it's important to take care of the people in the room and make sure that we can all sustainably do this work together and continue to do it um so I think just continuing to think about that as we move forward and try to continue to have patience for what's needed for each production um, ahead of time, I guess, um, which is gonna take time and that's okay because we've all been programmed to go, go, go and do things as fast as we can. Um, and we're learning now that we don't actually have to do that and we can have a product that is just as, you know, good or whatever um, without that urgency that actually can add a negative benefit to the process that can hinder the process, um, making things boundaries too tight and not flexible can hinder the process. Um, I, yeah, I guess that's it. And then, like I said, it would be great to have weekly schedules out earlier so people could plan their lives better, but it's hard. And that is also a work in process because there are tons of moving pieces, um, especially with five monologues and playwrights who are located all over the country. Um, and a hybrid rehearsal, that's wild too. That's a whole new world that we're not talking about right now, but. Thanks, Kaysen. Mm -hmm. Sarah, Natsuko, do you have anything to add? If not, it's totally fine if you don't. I mean, I think that Kaysen answered that really beautifully. I, I think particularly the revelation that um, patience and um, generosity and intention and um, sort of spaciousness are not those things and rigor in the work are not mutually exclusive and um, like that's just a myth that we have to let go of and I think we're working on letting go of that right now and I, I feel grateful for that and I already feel the benefit of that and I and I do feel greater need um, so I yeah but I, it, it does feel like the pandemic has created an opportunity um, to to sort of notice and examine urgency in particular and how that um, is actually an expression of of capitalism and white supremacy and um, and uh, and not necessary to the work and often uh, a hindrance to the work it feels very powerful. So I'm not saying anything that Kaysen didn't just say, but I would I would um, echo. Thank you all so much for being part of this conversation. It means a lot to me personally. I appreciate your time and um, thank you so much. And those of you who tuned in, thank you so much for joining us. And we really hope that you'll check out all of this amazing work that is happening for NACO's production of Out of Time in partnership with the Public Theater. Thanks so much. <laughs>